and switch here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Loretta Ross. I'm the Treaty Commissioner at the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba. And I wanna welcome you to our four part series entitled Treaties Moving Forward Together. Before we begin tonight, I do wanna go over some housekeeping rules with everyone. First off, this session is being recorded and we will share the video with attendees tomorrow. All participants have been muted until our live question and answer period at the end of tonight's presentation. We do hope that you came with some questions and we encourage you to share once we open up the floor after today's presentation for live audience question and answer. Feel free to post your questions in the feed loop chat. It's to the right of the screen or save them until the end when we open up the floor to live Zoom question and answer. So this four part series is an opportunity for us to reflect on treaties and the treaty relationship and renewal. But before we begin, we do want to start our session with a song by our Treaty 3 Elder, Sherry Copenese. So the song that I'll <clears throat> that I'll render for you um, is a song that I referenced uh, that belonged to my uh, great late great uncle, uh, the late Clifford Skeet, and this is the song he always rendered prior to going in into, into any one of the lodges. So I'll use my shaker. He always used um, a hand drum, but I'll use my shaker to to do that. <clears throat> Yeah, 
that was his song. Thank you. Um, much thanks to Elder Sherry for sharing your beautiful gift of song um, and starting us off in, in such a wonderful way. So we believe as we, we're going through the series that before we can have any type of renewal uh, and implementation of our treaty relationship, that first of all, we have to understand it. We have to understand the treaty relationship. And for many of us, a big part of that treaty relationship is understanding the views and the perspectives of, of each party. And in many instances, we have not come to understand and learn the First Nation perspective to the treaty making process. And so what we hope to do through this four part series is take you through a journey of understanding treaty. And of course we do that beginning with our elders. Our elders set the stage, they provide the guidance for us as we move forward um, in forging this new relationship or renewing this relationship. Um, and so tonight we will be hearing from our elders. And throughout this uh, journey that we will take you on, we will also hear from um, Aaron Mills, who will help us to understand First Nation concepts of Indigenous law, how Indigenous people, um, how they operated their laws, because we hear a lot of Indigenous law and not many of us have an understanding of, of what that means. So he's going to walk us um, through his perspective on what that is. And that too will build our knowledge base for moving forward and understanding our relationship. We will also ask uh, and have uh, Brenda Gunn come and spend some time with us. And she's gonna bring in the international uh, aspect to the treaties uh, through UNDRIP. We've heard a lot about UNDRIP and how UNDRIP is the, the framework for moving forward in a new relationship between First Nations people and non-First Nations people. UNDRIP has a strong connection to the treaties and I think it will help us to understand how treaties really is that framework for us in forging and moving forward in a new relationship. And lastly, we're going to come back full circle and have a conversation between myself and Aaron Mills in terms of how do we connect all of these pieces together? How do we put these all together and move forward on this path? And how do we do that, each of us, not just the governments, but as citizens as well? So we hope that each of these series that we bring to you will build on each other and help to form and guide you in understanding treaties. So tonight, um, we will be starting, as I mentioned, with two of our council mem members. They're going to set the stage for us and look at the true spirit and intent of the treaties. And we're going to do that through an elder's perspective. And so at this point, I'm going to um, stop talking and introduce you to our uh, esteemed elders. So with me tonight is Elder Florence Painter um, and Elder Harry Bone and Elder Florence Painter has, uh, is an Anishinaabe Kwe and Treaty One Elder originally from Sandy Bay First Nation. She is a wife, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. In her youth, Elder Painter attended residential school and has worked tirelessly throughout her life to foster awareness and deepen our understanding of the intergenerational impacts of residential schools. Elder Painter currently sits on the Elders Council for the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and the Treaty Commission of Manitoba. In addition to that, she is a Speakers Bureau for the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba and is often invited to speak on various issues, including the number of treaties, residential schools, and the impacts of colonization. For the past several years, Elder Painter has been invited as a guest lecturer at the University of Winnipeg. As a recognized knowledge keeper, she sits in an advisory capacity to the National Council of Elders at the world-renowned Turtle Lodge in Saguin. She is also an elder in residence at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. She was recently recognized for her many years of cultural leadership at the 2021 Keeping the Fires Burning, where she was inducted into the Circle of Honor. So we are honored to have Elder Painter with us. And also here tonight with, with us, with Elder Painter and myself, we have Dr. Elder Harry Bone. Elder, Elder Bone is a Treaty 2 Elder from Kishikowinin Ojibwe Nation. He was raised by his grandparents who taught him the importance of maintaining ties to language, land, and culture. Their influence and teachings helped him to become a strong supporter of First Nation rights throughout his life. 
Elder Harry Bone is currently the chair of the Council of Elders for the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba. He maintains a close relationship with the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba, and we're happy that he does that. He acts as a special advisor and is involved in many of our initiatives, such as Treaty Education and the Speakers Bureau. He is also an elder in residence at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and a member of the Turtle Lodge. He also serves as a member of the National Elders Council of the Turtle Lodge. So I welcome you both to the session. Um, we will entertain uh, audience questions throughout or through the online chat um, at the end of the presentation. But let's start first with the first question. Let's talk about spirit and intent of, of treaties. Um, what do we need to know and understand with respect uh, to the spirit and intent of treaties? And maybe I'll turn to Elder Painter if you could walk us through um, you know, some of your thoughts on what the spirit and intent of treaties mean. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you for the uh, opportunity and the invitation to come and speak on something that uh, we want people to understand, you know, the uh, spirit and intent. And I think when we, when we talk about spirit and intent, it's important for us to make people understand exactly what it is, what we mean from a, a First Nations perspective. I, I welcome each and every one of you, and I also want to acknowledge that I do carry a spirit name, and I do carry um, my clan is from the bear, and I'm, I'm also from uh, Treaty One territory. And I normally would say all of that in my language. And I know that it's very critical for us when we look at the spirit in which the treaties were made. I think there's uh, many considerations. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that uh, we had treaties, but tonight we are focusing on uh, the treaties that were made in 1871. And, and it is to say that um, before 1871, our people had treaties with one another. But tonight I really do want to focus on from 1871 and to look at the understanding of it. And the reason I want to do that is because I think it's important for all of us to begin to um, to build that knowledge together. So I want to do a quick review in terms of uh, how it is that uh, we came to the treaty making process. First and foremost, I think that um, as a people, we are very grateful for, uh, for what the creator has given us. And I know that as a people, we have a history of knowledge that tells us about the about how our ancestors that later went into into the treaty uh, had so many uh, principles in which they based their uh, sovereignty and I, and I think when I when I do speak in my language it, it is to say that I am a sovereign and I'm also um, uh, from Sandy Bay First Nation. And I know that um, when the treaties were made, they were done on a nation to nation basis. The other thing that I really wanted to uh, press on is that um, our treaties are based on our inherent rights, and it's based on the fact that uh, uh, we were placed here on Mother Earth, and which we called uh, Turtle Island now because of the boundaries that were created. Um, but I do know that uh, all of Turtle Island, including into the states, uh, was all part of, um, part of the initial 
the original boundary of our of our people. I also want to acknowledge that um, uh, you know our spirituality played a very big part when we were our forefathers went into the treaty making process. And I think this is where we need to have a clear understanding that um, Canada, the word itself, uh, translates to Canada. It's a very sacred, sacred land. And, and I believe that um, with the sacredness comes and is found in how we express ourselves in our language. So I know that um, from the treaty making process, there were so many principles that, uh, that were considered. And some of these principles, you know, because we have, we have a large land base in, in which the creator had placed us. But we also do have a, a shared history as a people with the uh, settlers and with the uh, people that um, were designated uh, to be the representatives of the crown. Uh, you know, Can uh, Canada, Canada was given the obligation from uh, the crown to, um, to implement the treaties, but I, I think that uh, it must be understood that our treaties are with the crown. And, and that's uh, uh, with the uh, uh, with Queen Victoria and through the generations, you know, how it has um, transformed into what it is today. And, and it continues to be that uh, significance that our people hold and, and will, uh, will always go on that basis as we as we approach uh, the um, the spirit and intent of the treaties well we also look at um, uh, when we look at the uh, our form of government and I mentioned that I am from the uh, from the bear clan and the reason I, I mentioned that I'm from the bear clan because I think there is an indication that our people went into the uh, government, to the uh, treaty making process uh, uh, when they were the signatories. And if you look at the history of it, look at the history of the document, look at uh, some of the, uh, the uh, writings or sketches, you know, there's a uh, uh, there's imprints of a bear paw. There's imprints of whatever clan our people represented at the time and signing of the treaty. So that's very important for uh, for people to know and and to understand that we do have a form of self government governance. And I think when we uh, did the nation to nation bases, I think also attest to the fact that uh, uh, we were recognized and acknowledged as, um, as being a nation. So I think that's important for, for people to, to know. And we also have our, uh, our connection to the uh, spirituality being the very very uh, strong connection to the uh, uh, spiritual realm that uh, uh, when we speak, we are speaking from our heart. We are speaking from our, our spirit. So I know when the treaty making process wa was being initiated that our people went into ceremony and they just didn't go to the table to uh, to discuss the treaties. That um, everything they did uh, was for the uh, generations 
uh, seven generations ahead. So when we talk today of anything, it is important for us to remember that we are always going to be speaking from that uh, viewpoint as well, that what we say and do today, it has to impact the things that are going to to be uh, uh, the future for our our children and it includes our children yet to come so when we speak about the spirit you know it encompasses all of who we are as anishinaabe people as the uh, different nations of people that are represented in uh, in canada and i also want to acknowledge you know that uh, that um, it's important for us to be able to move forward because I think that uh, uh, when we are doing some negotiations that as decision makers, you also need to have that information because uh, you know our people and your ancestors came into this land to uh, to look for something better than what they had in their country or for whatever reason that people have come to this country you know you have totally benefited and you have benefited because our people are a kind gentle people and we continue to reach out but we continue to um to try and lift our spirit and try and and continue to uh, to be who we are inside uh, you know and uh, and that is why it is important for us to know the spirit uh, of why we went into the uh, treaty making process and it's going to continue and uh, i really believe that uh, together we can move forward you know, there's so many opportunities that that I see happening, and I think we need to continue to to create these opportunities for one another. And because uh, you know, as the world was awakened by the uh, by the finding of all the uh, of all the bodies of our of our our children, I think it was a great spiritual wake up call for us you know to uh, to do something and it is through these findings that um, we carry that message we carry that voice for those children that didn't have the opportunity to be able to uh, to benefit from from what we are trying to uh, benefit all of us as a people together and we believe that uh, we share our country very freely you know there hasn't not been a person that's been turned away you know we've we've wel welcome you and we'll continue to welcome you and i say miigwech for uh, again the opportunity to be able to speak something that is very dear to us as uh, as elders you know and to and to promote that togetherness that understanding that uh, collective understanding in order for us to uh, be able to work together side by side and i've seen so many good things happening you know so with that i want to say miigwech again thank you for that opportunity to be able to to talk to each and every one of you and i and i also thank you as well miigwech thank you elder painter um and it just conjures up a a lot of of questions and thoughts that i have but i'll hold off on that myself as i know some of the our our audience is no doubt uh thinking of them 
I, I think we'll turn now to our dear friend, uh, Elder Bone, and uh, ask Elder Bone if he could share some thoughts as well around the spirit and intent of, of treaties. Good afternoon or good evening, my friends. It's always important to talk about our treaties from our perspective, not from the Western perspective for Mars. Um, that's why the languages are important right at the outset. Um, I want to emphasize that you know, the, our rights come through our languages, through our ceremonies, through our teachings, and it doesn't come from someplace else. Um, I always make reference to my grandmother and my grandfather. They were born in 1880s, so they were still fresh when they were young, you know, in their lives when the treaties were discussed at that particular time. Right? So that's why those words are very, very important. The English words, a treaty, the spirit and intent of treaties. Um, why were treaties made, you know, then uh, why were they like that in terms of social ceremonies? So I think that's important for us. Um, so I think the languages of our people is a source of who we are. So we always talk about from that sense. Uh, as my grandmother often said, um, if one day you lose your language, um, you're going to lose your how you think as an Indian person, you should not be a person. You have to use somebody else's language to explain who you are. Yeah? And that's exactly what happened to us. The English language now is a language that we use. Uh, that's somebody else's language. That's somebody else's concepts, someone else's law. That's the reason why we're in a hell of a mess today, yeah? because of that process. And that's the purpose for the governments or the Indian Act, residential schools to deny us those very simple rights about our languages. And, but the spirit of our language, the spirit of our treaties is important because that's when Florence talks about them. It's what the creator has given to us. It's important for us as a spirit part of it. And we have teachings that are associated with, you know, more than that. And those words are in the language of our people. In other words, love and respect, kindness, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, those are the spiritual gifts that we got from the Creator. So that's what the spirit and intent of our treaties were. Uh, the spirit of our people were guided by the Creator to make sure that more than we make that connection. That's why we call them sacred laws. The first laws of our people are called sacred laws. And that's that word spirit and intent of the treaty. Um, the intent of the treaty is also very important because the intent was you know, the, what did we want to be yeah, by the time of treaty? Um, there's a number of things that you know we, we were, were not negotiated. And those were our languages, our belief systems, our faith, and who we are as First Nations people. So that's why you know the, within our languages and our ceremonies are important because that's our source of who we are as nations. So as treaty was made 150 years ago, the term, of course, is not Shnabe word, Ago Idiwin. Agoidiwin simply means relationship and eh? sharing this great land. Eh? So that's what it means. Eh? So for us, I think, you know, the Kagishimini is young is what we talk about all the time, what the Creator has given to us. So the ones that I always talk about, you know, the one is I saw my grandmother at a very early age um, about our ceremony. So it's a pipe ceremony. That's my favorite talk, talk topic because you know, I like to share that with you all the time because it's who I believe, you know, taught me about you Northern, know, who we are as nations who we are as sovereignty and who we are as people and our identity and our constitution as for our pipe ceremonies. And as you watch very carefully at a pipe ceremony, you know, the elder will make that circle point upwards to the skies. Uh, that's to acknowledge there's only one creator for all of us, uh, for all of us, all of us. Uh, that's just to mention that, you know, the creator for all of us. Uh, circle makes that circle points downwards and to acknowledge you know, the, the earth, uh, making acminess, uh, to make sure that you know, the natural laws for our people are, are honored. So as he makes that circle, you know, to himself, you know, that on behalf of all of us. Eh? So the thing to remember about that pipe ceremony is a forest, three directions, eh? one to the creator, one to the land, and one to us as people. Eh? The creator is the sacred laws, the earth is forces our natural laws, and then we as humans are the human laws. Eh? But we've been blessed as people, eh? all of us, eh? from wherever you come from, we've been blessed with four distinct gifts. Uh, that's the, the languages for our people, the teachings of who we are, the history to understand where we come from and the journey that we have in our lifetime. 
see all of us have a, a responsibility and obligation in our lifetime to make sure that we we carry out you know the, the, what the treaties were were meant to be so i think for all of us you know then the ceremonies are important you know they're hidden some time but you know the more than the, the grandfathers and grandmothers of our time you know kept these treaties for ourselves so that's why we talk about these things and for us i think you know to talk about treaty is about who we are as people as my grandmother often said you know the northern northern uh, it's our treaties that was based on who we are as nations and so i think as we talk about the northern northern that way we were you know the anishinaabe onishawewen is not the words in this law anishinaabe onishawewen on the agwaitiwen and so that's where these words are so that's why i emphasize and because northern 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 uh, the treaties were based on our languages on our ceremonies 150 years ago that was our source eh? on the crown side they also had an obligation a mandate you know where they come from and you know, the northern where their rights come from eh? but ours came from you know for our language and our ceremonies so that's the reason why you know the government of the day 150 years ago thought it was their right uh, to you know the northern uh, take away our rights take away our languages you know through the residential schools and you know, so that's the northern what they has created for us eh? but for us i think it's important as we talk about you know, with our treaties um, See, that's why the Treaty Commission was established uh, some 15 years ago, when its objective, of course, public education, public awareness, to talk about who we are, the true history of our people. Because, you know, the academics that told us that, you know, it's important that our perspective, not only the Western perspective is included in our talks, the perspective from our side. That's why, you know, the Treaty Commission, you know, the, took the journey to interview some 200 elders here in Manitoba, in their communities on focus groups and one by one to make sure that we understand what our rights are from the treaties perspective and we spoke in their languages as you probably know here in manitoba we have five distinct speaking groups and the coda or the creed the Anishinaabe people the dani and of course the island lake people and so we spoke in their languages to make sure that northern we, we you know we recorded all the things that they said about our people the reason for that is because northern, northern we realized them uh, Northern, Northern, it's our perspective, uh, it's through our languages, uh, for our own knowledge, uh, that's what we are, because the academics told us that Northern, Northern history has always, always been written from one perspective, uh, and that perspective, of course, Western perspective, Western thought, uh, that's how Western law now becomes a, a major pro in our, in our, in our, in our situations. Uh. But I think, you know, from our side, uh, you see now the government uh, sees fit uh, because the general public thinks I know the awareness of treaties is important who we are as nations so that's why you know the, there's that drought about who we are as people and, but going back to treaties you know then why that's important because when we agreed to treaties um, we agreed to a number of things uh, to share this great land uh, as you probably know 150 years ago especially here in the prairies that uh, the number of treaties um, you know there was two objectives that the federal government had uh, one was to build a railway across the great nation uh, the other one of course is immigration we welcome that opportunity, but we also said to, to the government of the day, we want to maintain the original spirit of our people, uh, you know, the languages, the ceremonies, who we are as nations, people, and the way that we look after ourselves. Uh, so I think it's important to go backwards and to make sure that you know, that's where we come from. So that's why the elders of today, the elders of yesterday, the elders before them, uh, emphasize the ceremonies are people important because you know, the world, if we don't go backwards and because we start relying on the English perspective, uh, the English law, the Western part. Uh, so that's why you know, the, uh, we're in a mess right now in our communities because you know, the, we simply didn't follow the original gifts of our people you know, to make sure that we maintain who we are as nations. So every time you do a pipe ceremony, every time you witness a pipe ceremony, uh, it's a de declaration of our sovereignty, our nationhood as rights as people, as nations. So that's what it is. Uh, that's our law. That's our constitution. Uh, it's based on four principles. Uh, Northern, Northern. It's the languages for our people, the teachings for our people, the history of who we are, and the journey that we have. Uh, that's where that gives by the sacred laws and the natural laws. So I think we need to come from that perspective. Otherwise, Northern, Northern, Northern we're falling into the, you know, the eyes Northern, and the hands of the, of the government then because of what happened under 50 years. Uh, that was the intent for them. So as we talk about you know, who we are as treaties, I think you know, then we need to have that discussion. That's why the Treaty Commission is, is, has great you know, 
has done great things for us, you know, teaching peace in the classrooms, uh, but not only but public awareness, also discussions amongst elders, uh, what our treaties are all about, who we are as nations. Uh. So Anishinaabe is a word we use you know, for languages and you know, our people. So I think it's important that we do that. Uh. But we also have you know, ceremonies that we conduct all the time, uh, whether Sundance, Madarian teachings, pipe ceremonies, sweat lodges, whatever ceremonies that we have, uh, we simply you know, exercise the rights of who we are as people. Uh. Is an important part of that. Because my grandmother was the best teacher of my lifetime. Eh? As I started to learn about you know, our ways eh? in the 50s and 60s, as you probably know that you know, the year 1951 is an important year for us, eh? because that's when the Indian Act was revised, eh? that they allowed us to speak in our languages to do ceremonies openly at that particular time. Eh? So I was raised in those first terms. Eh? what our ceremonies, our pipe ceremonies, sun dances, sweat lodges, and you know, all those things that happened in those days. And also, I was forced not to raise by my grandparents to make sure that I understand what our ceremonies are all about. And so for us, I think, you know, then we need to go backwards uh, because you Northern know, Northern, that's why you Northern know, Northern, our organizations led by our chiefs, and I know sometimes Northern, we never go back to our source who we are. Uh, we follow the government's wishes, you Northern, know, it's the Western law and the civil law that they practice here in Canada. But I think, you know, the indigenous law is now on the scene. Eh? The indigenous law is based on the treaty perspective, eh? on the languages and ceremonies of our people. Eh? So I think that's where it's, it's got to come from. For us, I think it's important, you know, that we need to teach young people what, you know, who they are as people. Eh? Teach what, you know, what the treaties are all about, you know, what our ceremonies are all about, especially the language. Eh? The language is a key thing. And because, you know, as my grandmother would say to me that time, eh? If one day you lose your language, uh, you lose your lose how you think as an Indian person. Uh, you'll just have to use somebody else's language, somebody else's ideas, somebody else's beliefs of, to trying to explain who you are. Uh, the, the sad part of it is that's where we are today. Now, you know, we're using somebody else's concept, somebody else's law, trying to explain who we are. And the government just walks over us, you know, for the crisis that we have in our communities. So for us, as in public educators, as elders, you know, the northern we stress upon you know, the our youth. Uh, it's our history, uh, it's through our languages, through the stories of our people, you know, through the gifts of our people. That's what's important for all of us. Uh. So I think, you know, then as we talk about treaties, uh, as we've talked about this series that the commissioner is talking about, you know, then to set you know one side for us to have that discussion. Uh, first of all, she wanted to make sure that you know, the northern we have the elders' perspective to make sure that you northern know, our treaties are based on, you know, what our knowledge, uh, our treaty knowledge uh, from our languages. So you see, you know, the treaty commission, uh, you know, commissioned, you know, the northern uh, uh, was able to, you know, the northern consulting with the, with the, with the professors. Uh, the professors told us that northern northern what's important about this your perspective as well, uh, because our history has always been by, written by somebody else. Uh, that someone else is at Western thinking, Western thought. Uh, now they said, you know, it's your perspective, your side. Even the Canadian law now tells us, uh, the federal government now tells us, uh, now the Supreme Court tells us, uh, the oral history of our part, that's why Indigenous law is not becoming the scene. Uh, that's why, you know, the Northern, in our institutions, uh, they're starting to you know, the understand why the language is important to our Indigenous languages. Uh, so for us, I think, you know, as we talk about these things, Northern Northern, we talk about from our perspective, from our side, eh? that's our thoughts. Eh? I think it's important for us. So for us, I think, you know, that it's nice to have these kind of dialogue, these kind of discussions so that people could understand, you know, the, what their true nature, the true spirit of our treaties are, eh? the true intent of our treaties are. Eh? See, we know the Northern, as Florence has mentioned, you know, the Northern Northern, we agreed to share this great land, eh? But we re maintain to have certain rights for our people. Eh? That's the languages for our people, the ceremonies for our people, the history for our people, and the way we do things. Eh? Yes, we agreed to share the land, eh? but we wanted to have equal justice, equal opportunity, equal opportunities to do the kind of things that we want to do. That's what we agreed at treaty time. Eh? But the government of the day, you know, did a good job, like you know, the, you know, the, tried to finish us off, like you know, through the. You know, the process of civilization assimilation. So that's what you know, happened in the last 150 years. So the Indian Act, residential schools. So we, we're here today, 2021 now, you know, the Northern Northern. We have most elders now, you know, the Turtle Lodge and elsewhere that talk about who we are as nations. So I think you know, these kind of discussions are important. 
So with that, you know, then I want to thank you very much for this brief time to say a few words. So, Shimi much. Well, thank you, Elder Bone and Elder Painter. And I think I want to take this uh, the next few minutes before we open it up to the audience to, to maybe ask a couple of questions uh, myself and, and maybe ask you to elaborate a little bit. And I want to go back to Elder Painter. And you, you covered a lot of things in, in your presentation. Um, you know, oftentimes when we think about treaties or what we think we know about treaties, a large part of it, at least if we've been trained in, in the Western world, is we come back to the written text, right? The written text has been the guide for many of us, um, whether we're um, politicians, legislators, ordinary people. What does it say in the treaties? People often want to say, well, what does it say in the treaties? Let me read uh, the treaty. And you can certainly do that. But when we're talking spirit and intent, and Elder Bone touched on this when he said the Supreme Court of Canada has said, listen, you know, we have to, if we're going to understand treaties, we have to understand that First Nation perspective. We have to understand the intent of the parties at the time of entering treaty. And so that gives a, an opportunity or a voice for First Nations people to share and to, for people to listen finally in many ways, right, what that perspective is. So when you were speaking about First Nations people coming to treaty and they brought everything essentially with them, land, their language, their history, everything, it wasn't just a written document, right, something simple like that. They brought everything with them. And you talked about um, like the span of time and, and there's a great concept and I know I've heard you both uh, talk about it and I'm hoping you can elaborate a little bit on it and I'm going to say it in Anishinaabe so I hope I say it right and you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong but I think it's Akubachigan right Akubachigan is, is kind of like from what I understand the kind of linking can you maybe talk a little bit about what that means and its relation to, to treaties and treaty making for First Nations peoples? Definitely. Miigwech. Anikubichigan. 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 That's a term that, uh, that is used in, in a couple of contexts that I can uh, relate. Mm -hmm. uh, one is... Uh, from a, a mother's point of view, right? It's uh, our connection and how we came from the uh, uh, from the uh, spirit world and how the Creator uh, made it possible for us to come to this physical realm we call Earth, mm -hmm. and and that also entails our spirit that we are given at that at that time and that spirit that we will work with on our physical time on earth mm -hmm. uh, you know and uh, we often refer to that as our spirit or a little blue light that is inside each and every one of every individual whether whether you're from this country or not. We came through the same way and we're gonna go back the same way. Uh, another level of understanding of it is uh, uh, when the treaties were made, it's almost like there's the written text and there's also the oral text. The oral text or the oral way is our way and it's been through generations intergenerationally and we sit and we are told about our history we are given all the teachings that uh, uh, dr bone was referring to mm -hmm. you know through our ceremonies through our songs through the gifts that were given to us at Mishnabe people. Um, you know, that's the medium of how Kitani Kobe, the woman in the end, whatever it is. So, as a mother, I transfer that knowledge to my children in the hopes that they too will transfer that knowledge 
to the grandchildren and so on right so mm -hmm. it, it's it's almost like a, yeah, it goes and that's why when we talk about seven generations we always think ahead mm -hmm. that whatever it is that we say and do has to be in a good mind in a good spirit because it's going to impact what we say today mm -hmm. may impact our children yet to come. Mm -hmm. So that's that term, Aniku Bichigandan, and maybe Harry, Dr. Bone might have another. <laughs> Do you want to add to that? or? Yeah, I think that's an important word, Aniku Bichigayan, Aniku Bichigayan, meaning it's a linkage. Uh, Meaning that we have to go to the source of who we are. God gives you many goes in the gifts that the Creator has given to us and reach the source. Uh, not in between, not in all the northern, northern all the few years ago or 100 years ago, but to, to the original source. Uh, that means that we're, we're linking ourselves you know, to the beginning of time, to what the Creator has given to us. And you know, we talked about more than the sacred laws and natural laws, that kind of stuff. You know, we have to make those connections. Uh, otherwise, you know, the northern. Uh, we didn't start here, what is now Manitoba and Canada when the Europeans arrived here. We were very much alive practicing our traditions and our ceremonies and our languages before the Europeans arrived here. Even before treaty was signed, we still exercise those kind of rights. So in other words, we have to make that linkage all the way backwards, uh, not in order to follow the white man's in order to how they amended the Indian Act from time to time, their legislation, uh, but the gifts of our people uh, if you listen very carefully in our languages uh, about ceremonies, uh, you can hear the elders as they talk about the history. Uh, it goes backwards. Uh, even the languages for our people, there's a difference in our languages. Uh, there's one language you know, that speaks in everyday life. There's also the languages of spiritual connections. Uh, when, uh, when, an, uh, when an elder speaks in the uh, Anishinaabe language, uh, you can tell it's deeper. Uh, there's also the language you know, the more sacred there. Uh, through our various sacred, you know, the ceremonies and uh, the languages of our people. That's to make that connection to the source of our people. Uh, so that's what Anikobichi Gaiwin means, you know, the, you make that linkage and you know, not in between, not, not you know, the, the, when the Europeans arrived here, but that connection. Uh, so that's why, you know, the, those words are important. Anishinaabe words are important. So if you drag that word, it simply means Anikobichi Gaiwin, meaning not northern. There's a series of links that we make moving on thousands of years that we had over the years. Uh, so I think it's important for us you know, to use those kind of words, you know, the northern and uh, translate them into the way that you know, we see them. So that word on the is an important word. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the proper um, pronunciation. And I'll, I'll, I will work on that. Now, there's uh, another uh, concept that, um, and I'm going to turn to Elder Bone to, to maybe respond to this. But in, at the time of treaty making, and again, in, in looking at the context of uh, the negotiations or the conversations that were there, one of the um, phrases that uh, for First Nations people is important as they've you know, entered into treaty making with the view to the future um, for themselves and for generations and for um, First Nation way of life to continue. But there's also a phrase that the commissioner had said, and it's, um, you know, as we enter into these, we give you, um, and you can probably correct me on this too, but what we give you is on top of what you already have. And that's an understanding that First Nations people um, have. Can I maybe ask you to elaborate a little bit on, on that phrase and that understanding? Uh, yes, I think that's uh, an important, uh term to use and to recognize that more than the, the treaty commissioner 150 years ago when he's talked about more than uh, to our people especially in treaty six uh, he made reference to this very important word uh, what he said is recorded uh, if you want to find it's recorded you know, it simply says as a treaty commissioner what i'm offering you for treaty is on top of what you already have uh, so what does that already have uh, you already have is those seven principles that I mentioned to you, uh, our sacred laws, our natural laws, and all the, and the four gifts of our people, uh, the languages, the teachings, 
in our history, in our way of life. See, that's what you know. He said that I'm giving you entreaty eh, on top of what you already have. Eh? You no, know, he had no right to give any land. He didn't. The land did belong to the treaty commissioner at that time. The land was belong to us. Eh? But I think you know, for us, you know, the northern, 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 that's what he said that we already have. So that's why you know the northern those treaties. You know, that was discussed 150 years ago. Our languages, our ceremonies, our history, our way of life was not there in the negotiation eh? because that's what the treaty commission meant. So on top of those things that we already had, eh? that's our ceremonies, our languages, our teachings, our way of life in a way that we conduct ourselves to speak for ourselves as well. Eh? So I think it's important to, to make sure that you know, then we go back you know, to these terms. These terms are very important because you know, then he meant something when the treaty commissioner mentioned that. Uh, so with that, Jimmy <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna ask you um, another question. I think we have a, a couple minutes before we kind of open it up. So I'm gonna take advantage of the time that I have with you. Um, and Elder Bone, you talked about this in, in your, um, when you were talking about spirit and intent, and I think it's something that I'd like to ask both of you to elaborate on or give your understanding. You said, and here I am going to practice my Anishinaabe again. Um, I'll go with you, and then it's plural, I know. Um, I'll go with you, I, you know, and I think about this all the time, and here I come to say, I go with you, I go with, say with me. I go with you, and I knew I had it, it wasn't connecting. And you talked a little bit about it, but if you could maybe just um, talk more on what does it mean? Um, you know, not just the literal, of course, there's a literal translation of it, but the concepts behind behind it and why it's important that we understand what that means. That term, uh, is a, there's a singular one and a plural one. Uh, go with you in is, no, is, is one treaty. Uh, treaty one, uh, go with you in is one treaty. Like we do in none is several treaties, eh? more than one treaties went to 11. Eh? But that word, ago idiwin, simply means that no, then you establish a relationship. Eh? You put something on top of the other. Eh? See, that's what the commissioner meant. So, ago idiwin, you know what the commissioner says, what I'm offering you in treaty is on top that I already have. See, so it made that connection. Eh? You know, you put it together. Eh? So, that side relationship eh? is forever. You know, then is there forever. Eh? And that's why those terms that, you know, the, in a treaty metal that you often make reference to, mm -hmm. as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the water flows, uh, it's that connection, uh, it's that relationship that's important for us. Uh, so that's what agoi duen means. So that word treaty uh, has an important meaning, turning it into our language. Uh, treaty is about relationship. Uh, treaty is about Northern Northern, that human relationship. We agreed to certain things, but we also agreed to re maintain and to keep some of our own rights at that time. Uh, so that's what a good doing means to us. Well, the painter, mm -hmm. did you want to add? I certainly do. Uh, you know, uh, it's very interesting. I know that uh, I give you on top of what you already have. And I think it's, uh, it's an acknowledgement mm -hmm. of what we have as a people, you know, uh, that we are nation to nation. Uh, we have our nation, nationhood, mm -hmm. and we have our sovereignty. We have our, our own way of uh, of doing what we do. Yeah. And I know spirituality plays a big, big part in our lives and has always been a big part of our lives mm -hmm. and will continue to be because that is our link that is our connection mm -hmm. and that's how we are as a people mm -hmm. uh, you know like with with the gifts that we have been given i think we have really held true and, and what makes us all true is embedded in our language it's embedded it's in our spirit mm -hmm. and we believe in the creator and we believe that uh, when we made these these end shakes, mm -hmm. uh, you know that all of creation was witness to that. So that's why we can never break that treaty. Yeah. Our treaties was blessed by the Creator. 
Mm -hmm. Miigwech. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if we do have some questions. Um, if there's isn't, I, I have another question that I can um, perhaps share with you or ask. And it kind of leads to um, some of the things that you're talking about, Elder Painter. Um, you know, we have la language, we have history, we have ceremonies. Um, on, and it refers back to Elder Bone saying, um, you know, what is it that First Nations people already had on top of what you already had? And, and sometimes that's where the question goes. What is it that we already had? And here, th here's another phrase. And um, I'm going to try for the third time um, to, to say it and ask you to maybe um, elaborate. And it's Aja Minogoiziwen. Aja Minogoiziwen. I hope I'm saying that right. And I think that helps us. Um, if we're looking, how do we begin, whether you're a First Nation person or not a non First Nation person, but I think there's a, a task here and a, and a path forward, you know, regardless of which treaty partner you are. Um, but I think that that phrase or that word, Aja Minago, is even, am I saying it right, mm -hmm. um, is helpful to us. And I, I'm going to ask you if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on what that is, because I think you've You've said it, but I think people still need to hear it through through words like that. So, um, who wants to start? <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, that word uh, is an Anishinaabe word, of course. Mini goisiwen. Mini is uh, in English terms, um, <clears throat> what was given to us, uh, and to us, of course, are given to us by the Creator. Uh, so that's what meaning always even is if you drag that word you know then it reflects you not know, to the spiritual connection that meaning always even that you know aja means simply that you are already given you're already given you know the, the, the gifts of the creator eh? you know the, so you don't need to ask for them anymore eh? aja you know mean aja means that you're already given these rights eh? so you don't need to ask for them so that's what meaning going so is all about eh? but we use that term on you know the non-spiritual basis on now our discussions about you know who we are as nations. In other words, what that word means is like you know we were already given these rights by the creator. Eh? Where are we going around chasing around looking for these rights? Eh? They're already within us, eh? by our creator. So you know then why are we running all over the place? Eh? United Nations, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, all over the places eh? when our rights are within our hands. Eh? So that's why that term Aja meaning meaning all of us. Eh? As Florence has mentioned about that blue light, eh? the spirit in all of us, we were given that already. So that's the gift that the Creator has given to us, no, no, and nobody will ever take that away from you, no matter what might or how strong the government is, no, no, that's the right between you and the Creator. So Aja maybe In other words, that's what that word means. Eh? If you listen very carefully about no ceremonies, eh? You know, if you talk about, if you listen to the uh, the ones that speak our languages, uh, you'll you hear these words, uh, because in their prayers, uh, that's what they use in the languages of our people. So, miigwech. Elder Painter? Aja Vinigwizin, already you have an inherent right to all the gifts that we were born with. You know, and I and I think that uh, there's an understanding of how closely connected we are to the land. We are very close to the land, and it's almost like we are the land, right? Mm -hmm. And and we are the stewards, internationally, globally known as stewards of our land. And why is that? Because I think, again, it has to do with recognition that we have these aja uh, mini mm huizina -hmm. that we have, that we carry. And, and I go to the, uh, to the story about, uh, you know, how this braid of sweet grass represents us as a people, our mind, our body, and our spirit. 
but it also represents your mom, your dad, and yourself. Uh, you know, that connection uh, and the strong, the strong bond that it has and how it's connected. You see how it's connected through that braid? So nothing should break it, right? So, and then we have the, uh, the trees and often the cedar tree is represented, you know, and that should uh, rep represent another gift that it was given to us. And also the rocks, you know, the rocks are the uh, oldest beings. Remember, everything has a spirit. Every creation has a spirit. That's our, that's our belief. And we know that because we know that the, um, the neighbors, the people that have come on, we know they talk to their animals too. Mm -hmm. We know even they talk to the trees, right? Mm -hmm. But we were frowned upon doing that, but we never lost faith. We, we just keep doing what we do because mm -hmm. those are mini guizi, nana. And that's the understanding that, uh, you know, and we can, we can use so many other examples, but I think you kind of get the idea mm -hmm. how closely we are connected to the land and connected to the, uh, to the spirit realm and, and to the creator. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that takes me to, to another thought when we're talking about treaty. And I think Elder Bowen had mentioned that with the treaty metal that we use to um, symbolize the relationship. And there's a lot in, in the treaty metal, I think that people should be aware of. And um, if you could maybe elaborate on the phrase, I mean, we're all treaty people, um, but the phrase that for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the waters flow. If you can, you know, from that um, spirit and intent perspective, what does that mean? What does that mean for First Nations people? Again, speaking from, uh, from being, having been a mother, uh, I think that's uh, first and foremost is that creation and our ability to be able to carry that life, you know, and as long as we keep having children, that water from the creator is going to flow. And because, you know, that's, that's our connection, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and we look at the, uh, at the water that's, uh, that's, what is happening to our water all over the world, right? I think it's a reminder that we really need to pay attention to our children and why we do what we do, right? It's, it's that connection again. And as long as the grass grows, you know, uh, and as long as the uh, uh, grass grows, uh, the uh, rivers flow, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as long as the sun shines, uh, you know that uh, we will continue, continue to have those treaties, and they're they're always constant, right? They're constant, and uh, we're doomed when that sun doesn't come out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and we're doomed if we stop having children but we have a big responsibility to that life right right and that's what we're uh, we're really trying to advocate for our our young families mm -hmm. you know to take back that responsibility because i think um, there are so many government policies that have that have undermined us as a people, you know, and I think I can now give many more examples of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just to uh, answer the question uh, of the, uh, the uh, saying that goes with the metals, you know, yeah. that's I, how long our trees 
Right. And so that speaks to, I mean, the time element that many people think, uh, you know, this past summer, we just um, commemorated or celebrated 150 mm -hmm. years of treat yes. both your treaties, Treaty 1 and Treaty 2, yes. and that they're not frozen in time they're not some an event that happened 150 years ago that it continues through those words and that phrase for as long as the sun shines the grass grows and the waters flow yes. and so you know i do want to give our elder um bone because he's been quiet for the last few minutes an opportunity to also speak about you know some of the meaning behind that phrase to help us better understand what it why it's so important I think those are very important words. You know, you hear that word all the time, eh? as long as northern, northern, uh, but the reference to the sun, you know, reference to the grass, reference to the water. And, uh, but, you know, then if you go backwards uh, to what I said, you know, the northern, um, we have uh, spiritual laws, we have natural laws, we have human laws. Uh, the spiritual laws are connected to the sun. Eh? The sun, of course, is connected to the creator. Eh? That's our power of our people, like you know, the Nisrul, our sacred laws. Uh, and the grass represents you know, the natural earth, uh, the earth that we stand on. That's why we call it you Northern know, Mikinak Minas, uh, the grass you knows where the earth stands. Uh, and of course, the water, as well, for instance, mentions is about life. Uh, it's about human life. Uh, so as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the water flows, it's a term, uh, it's a nice term, uh, but it's actually what you're doing there, you know, is you're expressing uh, three important laws. Uh, the spiritual laws of our people through the creation laws, and all the ones we mentioned, the natural laws, the natural laws of our land, uh, the air, the water, and all that kind of stuff. In the human life, the human laws that Florence talks about, you know, the, the birth of people uh, forever. Uh, so those terms are very important because that's what they mean. Uh, it was actually coined by De Cumsey when he was uh, negotiating with Northern, you know, before Canada was there, like you know, Northern, uh, what those terms are. Uh, so that's important words. You see those words all the place, uh, you know, in Northern, uh, uh, how important they are, even a place where we were just a few days ago in Northern, uh, uh, about Mennonite University, about those words, uh, as long as the rivers flows, that kind of stuff is there. Uh. So I think they're important in such sense because in Northern, uh, those three words, uh, the sun represents, you know, the creation. Uh. It's not the creator, it's a creator represents the creation. Uh. The grass represents Mother Earth. Uh. And the water represents people. Uh, simply, it's just simply it says more than more than over. We believe in one creator. This land is for all of us, and life is equal in the eyes of the creator. So that's what they mean, you know. So that's what that means. So I think you know all that we need to put you know some action into those kind of words and the meaning of those words. They're not loose words. Uh. And the other thing that parts you know, is the power of the energy of the sun. Uh, is the energy without the sun, as far as it's mentioned, like you no, know, then we probably wouldn't survive. Uh, you know, the earth wouldn't survive, we as humans wouldn't survive. And you know, so that's why that national national kind of you know, process is part of what you know the, how to look after our earth uh, you know, the waters that we have here. So those are important words and you know the sun, the the grass and the water are very important words. You know, that makes reference uh, to you know our belief systems and uh, the sacred laws of our people uh, the natural laws of uh, Mother Earth and the human laws of our people. So with that mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I want to give our um, our viewers an opportunity to type in your, your questions for to chat with the elders. Um, you know, this is a unique opportunity and I encourage you to ask questions. There's no question that's, uh, you know, if you think it's a silly question, many people are probably thinking the same thing. So please feel free and take advantage of the opportunity um, to, to ask, the, uh, ask a question of our elders. Um, I can certainly continue to asking questions, but I want to provide a, a forum and an opportunity, an opportunity for you to share as well. So um, I'm keeping an eye on on the screen here, and so again, I hope that you will ask some questions. In the meantime, I'm going to go back um, and ask another question, and we've kind of um, rolled into it a little bit. And, and this is another common phrase uh, that we hear, and certainly. When I first um, became commissioner, was one that people challenged me on, um, and and that is we are all treaty people. We 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 hear that we hear it more now. Um, can can you maybe share your understanding of of what that means and why do we say that that we are all treaty people? And 
Who wants to go first? I think she's uh, <laughs> giving it to you, Definitely. Elder Bowen, first. <laughs> okay, I think it's, uh, you know, then I, uh, I remember when uh, the then commissioner, Dennis Whitebird, you know, the northern uh, suggested us, you know, then as a, uh, is to initiate, you know, then uh, an interest in people. Uh, we coined that, you know, he coined that idea where we, we are all treaty people. Uh, of course, there was a, a negative impact both ways, you know, from non Indigenous people and from our people and like Northern Northern. But the very term treaty is what a relationship. Uh, when we made treaties here 150 years ago, even before then, uh, and Florence has mentioned about treaties among, uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, treaty is about a relationship. Uh, so that's what it means. And like, no, no, that we're all part of it. Uh, we're all, you know, part of that treaty. Uh, you know, we, whether you're non-Indigenous or Indigenous, and like, no, then, uh, we're all part of that process. Like, no, treaty is not only for one side. Uh, treaty is for all of us. Uh, so the reason why that it was pointed because it sparks the interest uh, of people to say, why are we saying that we are all treaty people? You know, so I think, you know, the, the, it's just to kind of you know, initiate a discussion, a dialogue, you know, why that's important because what it simply leads up to, you know, the very first, you know, the meaning of it, what treaty is, what relationship. Eh? We all have a human relationship amongst each other and you know, we all have rights equal in the eyes of creators. So that's what it means. Elder, Elder Painter. <laughs> I remember back in the day when uh, when we did the uh, the promotion of we are all treaty people. I was the voice behind the uh, the uh, advancement of it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's uh, uh, it's been I think. Uh, uh, an opportunity for everybody to look at uh, what does it mean we are all treaty people, you know, and, uh, and we look at the partnerships. We look at what does it take to have a, a treaty relationship. Of course, it means that you need people mm -hmm. and you need people with uh, with ideas we you need people to partner with when, with something so it's always going to be about relationships you know and how we build those re relationship i think through the treaty commission right from the time that it had started 15 years ago is it now mm -hmm. uh, that i think the uh, the movement has been pretty incredible in terms of where we find ourselves today you know and i really credit a lot to the commissioners that we've had uh you being the uh, third commissioner for the uh for the province you know and i think that uh, we've done some uh, pretty amazing stuff under your your leadership yeah you know which really speaks to what i'm referring to mm -hmm. and i think when we look at the relationships sometimes it's hard for me to understand why a university or college will not recognize the knowledge that our people have you know based on what we're talking about this evening mm -hmm. I, I you know that's pretty deep knowledge to be able to share with people uh, to make them understand how do we as people in Canada move forward and I think it's based on those understanding uh, about what is treaty and what is the spirit and intent of treaties and we have spent the evening talking about that so forward you know to uh um, making more partnerships uh, developing relationships in, in order to to partner so we can all be uh benefiting from whatever canada has to offer and it should be on equal on equal footing yeah okay great it looks like we are getting some questions so you 
can uh, you don't have to listen to me anymore asking you some questions i'm going to ask some questions that are coming through the the chat and the first one that i see is from dan um, and he's asking or he's saying the treaty relationship that was there when we agreed to treaty four has changed over time where are we now today in the treaty relationship and i again uh, let me let me respond that uh this way um yes the, the original uh, treaties have changed um, um for two reasons uh, one of the one of the, the basic ones of course you know, we abandoned our you know the spirit and intent of our treaties from our perspective uh, through our languages through our ceremonies uh, we've now gone to the other side to try and explain who we are uh, so the more we do that you know the, the more that we give in to you know the, what the treaty was meant to be for the crown side. Eh? So that's why, you know, the Northern, Northern, and the crown recognizes that, you know, how weak we are in our languages and our ceremonies because most of our leaders can't even speak our languages anymore, don't practice our traditions and our ceremonies. Eh? See, that's the strength of our people. And the crown knows this, the gov Canadian government knows this. Eh? So that's why there's a change in shifts of what our treaties and like, you know, the Northern 150 years ago, eh? and we are on equal basis. Eh? But today, because you know, that we don't practice who we are as nations, eh? we don't practice who we are, you know, that is the original spirit of our internal trees. And those are the seven directions of the pipe. Eh? We don't do those kind of things anymore. You know, then to honor the creator, to recognize Mother Earth, you know, that we're all human beings, the languages, our teachings, our history, our way of life. Eh? We've already thinking like Western men, just like at the beginning, as I said, that was my grandmother said that. Eh? Once you lose your language, eh, you know, you're going to think like a white person. And that's exactly where we are. Eh? So some of that is, is on our side. Eh? Some of that is the fault of us and eh? not practicing our traditions. Eh? The more we do that, you know, the, 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 you know, the greater, you know, the uh, lesser meaning, you know, for our treaties. So we're, we're part of that process. So I think, you know, if you're going to re retrieve, you know, the, you know, who we are as nations, eh, you have to go back up. But, you know, and the other thing too to remember is like, you know, our treaties were signed in groups. Eh? especially in Treaty 4, eh, how many bands were there, eh? they have to work as one unit eh, to make sure that you know, then they counteract you know, what the government's doing to us. So that's probably that purpose. But you know, the real answer there is you know, that uh, we don't practice our traditions, we don't practice our languages, and we use white man's law anymore. Like, you know, the, there's no indigenous law on our side. Eh? We're practicing white man's law. That's why we're defeating ourselves. Eh? Can you ever imagine about you know, playing hockey or playing football? Eh? Using your opposition's playbook and you know, how you're going to defeat them, you'll never defeat them, you know, because you no know, you're playing their rules. Uh, that's exactly where we are now. Rich. Mm -hmm. Rich. Thank you. Wapangi Nishnabem when I got lots of work to do. Um, but thank you very much. I certainly understand the message uh, that you're sharing. I'm going to um, ask a question here because uh, we've got a number of them now um, and please forgive me if I mispronounce your name as you've seen I've mispronounced a few things tonight so please forgive me in advance but it's from um, Pishka and the question is can treaties be adjusted and amended and I don't know well I don't think um, I think the content of the treaty could be amended but we can't amend the original part of who you, why we signed treaties. Eh? The source of our treaty was based on those seven principles I mentioned. Eh? Mm -hmm. You can't amend those. Those are not negotiated for. Eh? Negotiation for, you know, then resources for land, you know, could be you know, amended eh? to reflect, you know, other times. Eh? But you, you could never go back, you know, to try and amend, you know, the, the original spirit and tenor of our treaties because the treaty was based on our nation, but eh? you know, Northern Northern as a right for the owners of the land. Eh? So we can go back out for that. You can go backwards a bit, you know, it's just to amend the process, uh, to negotiate for, you know, more than uh, the return of our lands, more than uh, the return of resources, that kind of stuff, you know, the, the reserve intent for, for our treaties, so more than, yes, you know, you can amend it, but, you know, the, not going back, you know, to the original source, only because, you know, then you can give up, you know, the basic rights of our people, uh, those rights, of course, is uh, the right to the creator, to the land, in our languages, in our teachings, in our history, in the way we like, can't negotiate those things. Mm -hmm. um, and Pishka has um, another question that I missed earlier, and perhaps I'll direct this to Elder Painter, 
but what is your perspective on ceremony? What is the word for it and how does one enter a ceremonial space and exit the sacred space? It's a, a very special place, you know, and uh, uh, like anything else, there's uh, protocols that, uh, that are, are unwritten and it's, uh, again, it's related to, um, to how much is being exposed to you as a child, right? Uh, but also there has been so much opportunity for our people to come back to ceremony and come back to reclaim and find their own spirit, ignite that fire that's within each one, right? And you can go to these ceremonies and, and be an active listener. And I remember when I, when I woke up, when my spirit awoke, it was in the early 80s. Early 80s. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, so in our journey, the spirit can be totally just just going along. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you come to a point. Oh my goodness, where have I been all this time? Where has been my thinking? There has to be a better life than what, what I'm experiencing mm -hmm. and what I'm witnessing. And then that's when you go inside and that's the, they, they say that's the hardest journey to make is into your heart. But, but in your heart is your spirit. And then once that, that is awakened, there is no stopping. There is no stopping. You want to know about, about your language. You want to know about your history. You, you want to know about how did our people survive before? Uh, you know, they've survived for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, uh, they have survived because there's things that binded them together, very closely knitted people, right? We had our uh, different land bases, you know, and, and we were referred to as being nomadic. But no, we weren't nomadic. We had our own places. Um, but we did go from place to place. And we followed the seasons. Mm -hmm. We followed the movement of our, uh, uh, our food sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but there was always a home base. And I think people need to understand that as well, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, those are all important things that have sustained us as a people and will continue to sustain us as a people. And our job as elders has been really to, to try and, and provide those opportunities for people to come mm -hmm. and everybody's welcome, nobody's gonna be turned away, uh -huh. whether from your this race or that race, because I think we all carry that spirit that needs to be awakened and needs to be transformed into something that, that has been different. And I usually ask people, think about where you are in life right now. Is that how you want to continue to live? Mm -hmm. Or do you wish for a better life? Right? And if you want a better life, of course you're going to seek what, what that life is. And I've gone to my elders and, and I've gone to our own people to get that history. And we have a very rich history. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that 
uh, everybody would just love it. In fact, there are so many people that want to be us, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's been good these days to be a Nina. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, thank you. And I think, you know, on top of being a, a, an active listener, as you say, is, is to be an active observer. Watch what's being done, you know, in terms of the, the ceremony that, that you're in. People do have different ways of doing mm -hmm. ceremony. Respect that. Um, be humble enough to to sit and, and kind of wait and, and observe and, and you will learn right and as you said most places uh, are inclusive they're welcoming and so you have to come and enter and respect that inclusivity that's that's being offered to you so I think that that's I hope that that helps our, our audience um, there's another question here what are the best ways for non-indigenous persons to uphold the original intent of the treaties who wants to tackle that elder bone well i think um the best way for non-indigenous people to you know than to support is to make sure that they, they know their history as well uh, the history hasn't been good to us uh, the history has been very negative for the last 100 years uh, 150 years uh, the government did a good job at uh, so what you know, non-Indigenous people have to do is reach backwards and uh, reconcile their own history and to make sure that you know, how the government operated, how they treated us. Uh, they have to keep awareness. Uh, they have to understand where their country is coming from, uh, as well as from us as well. Uh, to reconcile, you know, with, with our traditions, with our languages, and so forth. But I think you know, for non-Indigenous people to understand, uh, they have to understand the true history of Canada to make sure that you no, know, we had a an equal opportunity, equal justice at the beginning of our treaties. Eh? That's what we asked for. Eh? You know, you know, then why were our languages denied, our ceremonies, through ceremonies, that kind of stuff denied? Eh? So I think, you know, for many of these people, they have to understand that process. Eh? So I think, you know, we, they have to reconcile as well their history because the history of Canada is also, you know, built on uh, false pretenses. Eh? For instance, Dr. Discovery, like, you know, North America was never empty land when the people arrived here. Eh? We were very much alive. Eh? But so that history eh, is not only one side. So nine indigenous people to understand more than they have to reach backwards. Eh? They really have to reconcile their history. Eh? Their history is also not very bright, you know, to I know them, the way they treat people, first indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and there was a subsequent question very similar to that, Rhonda. Um, I hope that that also answers your question. Um, I have a question from Karen, and she's asking, could the elders give suggestions on how to engage our young people in learning the spirit and intent of the treaties and how to build our languages and teachings? Would you like to start that off, Elder Painter? Yes, for sure. I think uh, through the uh, treaty commission, uh, you know, there's a uh, a very strong team that uh, works together, and they work in uh, uh, they work in classrooms. They work with uh, teachers, you know. And uh, I had the opportunity to get my own kit. <laughs> Finally, yeah. you know. So, so uh, uh, when I went through it, uh, you know, I thought, "Oh my goodness, I was I was." I wish I was still in the classroom, but I'm a little too old to be in the classroom anymore. But uh, when I do go into the classroom, mm -hmm. I think that uh, there's great interest. And I think that, uh, and I've often said that before, right? And I always credit my friend, I know he's watching. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, when we, have been given the knowledge from our elders by going to ceremony and by sitting and listening and observing and taking in whatever it is that's going to make us a better person. We use that as a base and then we go back into our own community and we go search people that we may have overlooked that carry that same information, but nobody ever came to offer them tobacco to, to share, right? So I think uh, there's protocols that we, uh, we follow, 
and there's protocols that we teach about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and how to uh, to offer tobacco when when something is being uh, talked about, right? And I know that we use it as a an opportunity to teach the children, mm -hmm. you know. So if I had invited invited Dr. Bone to my classroom, I would offer him the tobacco in front of the classroom. And, you know, so we can talk about why am I offering you tobacco? I'm offering you tobacco so you can share the knowledge that you have with these young people. Because I think as the elders that have paid attention to our people, and because of our inner desire that um, we've accumulated that knowledge and we are now recognized as elders and traditional knowledge keepers. And our role as that is to be able to teach it, right? Mm -hmm. Because remember, it's a chain. We just keep teaching and we just keep modeling, you know, so oh. that's what we do. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's a comment here from Norma, and I do want to acknowledge that. And she's saying, I would like to thank you for sharing the sweet grass braid, beautiful in structure and meaning, very binding in strength for mind, body and soul for everyone. Yes, Norma, thank you very much for that. Um, another question that's coming forward um, from Alex, and he's asking, do you feel that our government leaders are understanding the spirit and intent of the treaties collectively? You, you know, uh, collectively is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, uh, uh, when we begin to, uh, to speak to people, I think there's a relationship building opportunity that happens. And then from there, it's almost like the, uh, you know, it multiplies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I think through the, uh, the speaker's bureau, I think that's, that's the concept, right? Like we have uh, incredible speakers on the speaker's bureau that, that address many things that people may have, but our challenge is to get the leadership. We can't even get our own leadership collectively and unify them on some of the things that we really need to move forward with, right? Mm -hmm. But I think if we uh, continue to uh, meet with individuals, meet with groups, and it multiplies, right? And, and before you know it, we have allies that are, are forming all over the place. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I put my hope on that. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, here's another question from Michelle. And the question is, as a student of law and politics, wanting to change the colonial settler system from the inside out, what is the most critical step I can take to make a meaningful difference in advocating for the for honoring of the treaties? I think um, that question is very critical for um, a law people that we, we that represent us, especially our, our Aboriginal lawyers. Um, first thing you need to do, of course, is to understand that Northern uh, you know, then the civil law and common law, that's their side. Uh, that's what you study uh, when you go to law school. That's what you uh, swore an oath, you know, when you become a lawyer, uh, is to protect their law. But I think, you know, indigenous law is not coming onto the scene. as the Supreme Court decisions, you know, then through Delgamog and other cases, you know, that happened to us, that oral history is now part of that process. Uh, so it started to happen now across the great country, uh, you know, more than uh, indigenous law is not being taught uh, strictly from our perspective. Uh, 
not using Western concepts, Western that kind of stuff. Uh, through our languages, through our ceremonies, and all the other indigenous law has to be shaped on those principles. Um, the principles as we as nations. Uh, so I think you know if you know the difference there, and you know the northern, uh, if you can go back to our traditions, uh, what is the Anishinaabe laws? Uh, Anishinaabe on the you know, and what are they? What are the indigenous laws of our people? Uh, you know, you have to take a look at those first uh, before you know the northern, northern and that. Uh, so in other words, and like you know, the law profession, the law societies, the law institutions now, of course, you know, have that one side, uh, the Western law, the European concept, you know, the northern, that's where it comes from, that's what you're taught as lawyers. Uh, but now some you know, institutions are starting to recognize uh, that indigenous law because uh, the top court says that northern indigenous law is important. Uh, so that's where we're at now. But we also have to be careful with these institutions, uh, you know, the northern, to make sure that northern, northern our perspective is there, like Northern Northern, uh, my good friend, you know, the Northern uh, Aaron Mills, I hope he's still listening, you know, the Northern, he always gives us this phrase, uh, in business law is not in business version of Canadian law. Listen to those words, uh, in business law is by itself, uh, it's not a version of our law into a Canadian system. Uh, so there's a big difference. Uh, so I think you have to recognize that, you know, the Northern at the outset, uh, our law is different, uh, has had different sources, it has different meanings. Uh, so I think, you know, the, to, to separate those things, uh, you know, we can never put our indigenous law to try and fit into the Western law, you know, that'll never work. And because you know, it hasn't worked before, you know, it'll never work again. Uh, so ours has to be separate, you know, so, but there's a, there's an avenue, there's a form, there's a desire, uh, there's an appetite for indigenous law. That's why, you know, then take a look at the institutions across, across Canada, University of Victoria, Regina, Alberta, you know, you know, the, you know, the McGill University, you know, that kind of stuff. They're starting now to recognize how important that is uh, because that's the necessary tool because you know why? Because the general public, the general opinion tells us so. Uh, so that's why there has to be a change. Uh, so I think, you know, the opportunity is there for us to change that attitude, you know, what, you know, the, what laws, uh, our, our perspective is just as important as ours. So, but I think, you know, the more than, I want to go back to that phrase and because that's certain of you should know. Indigenous law is not indigenous version of Canadian law. You can't fit our law into their system because it'll never work. Yet. So I think you know indigenous law has got to stand on its own. So thank you for that question because that's an important question. And I hope that you know you keep working on that question because I think that's an important part of it. Because our hope is in this lawyers uh, to make sure they know the difference. Uh, not to, not to try and sell us what the Western law is all about, and because you know, the, the way that they're doing it now is they want they want to make money, so that's why they're staying with the Western law because that's where the money is. Uh, so indigenous law is important, you know, to protect our rights, you know, as indigenous people. So thank you much. Great, and yes, thank you very much for for the questions. I think this brings us to to the close of our our session this evening, our talk, our time with uh, the elders. But I do want to provide you each with a, an opportunity to have some closing remarks to to our audience um, before we we end the evening session. So I'll turn it to to Elder Painter. Okay. Well, uh, I want to uh, say thank you again for. Uh, the opportunity to come and share um, our thoughts and our perceptions and uh, and how we move forward. I think the uh, the uh, topic has been uh, uh, interesting to uh, to explore, and in, in particular to unpack the spirit and intent of the treaties, which is all so much related to who we are as a people. Um, there has been so many, so many things done to us to try and change us, change us. But that's not going to happen. Um, I was born on Nishnabe. I'm going to die on Nishnabe. And with that um, gift of life, I've also had the opportunity to learn from my elders and to really be able to transform myself into who I am today. And I want to say thank you to uh, the people that have been a big part of that process for me and with me, you know, and uh, the ancestors 
and my relatives that uh, that were there that uh, that were often considered people that uh, did devil worshiping and all that and I, i'm glad to say that um, you know what was classified as the work of the devil is also what we're promoting today because it's so good but because people didn't understand who we are uh, and and what we are i i think sometimes the uh, the thought you know so hopefully uh, we have been able to uh, change some mindsets and it's through action that we're going to see a change a collective action miigwech mm -hmm. Uh, uh, just some quick words. Um, the title of the series is, of course, we're in Port Aguidiwen, and those three words, spirit and intent of treaty. Um, the word treaty is a process itself. Uh, it's a journey. Um, but that journey was based on certain principles. Uh, what is the spirit of that, of that journey? Uh, what is the intent of that journey? Uh, the intent of the journey, of course, was know the gifts for our people through Northern Pipe ceremonies, know the in our laws and natural laws for our people and the sacred laws. Uh, so you have to go backwards. You have to understand what that means, and because know that all the like any law, uh, any lawyer that's listening, uh, you know, the Northern, uh, they have a concept. Uh, you know, the Northern, uh, what is the spirit of the law? Uh, the intent of the law. Uh, they often tell us uh, if the intent is is greater than the law itself. Uh, for instance, intent to murder. Eh? You murder somebody, but if you intend it, means that you know, it has greater weight. Eh? So as a result of that, you know, so the intent of our laws, the intent of our treaties should have as much weight as the treaty itself. Eh? So that's why it's important to go backwards. You know, I think that's why you know the commission that you know then suggested that that very title, spirit and intent of treaty, is important eh? because you know, then we have to understand <clears throat> what our original law is all about. Eh? The original source of our laws so, so that's the only place as i said as i mentioned before eh, because we're in a crisis now eh, <clears throat> we're using western law european law to try and advance our causes and you know, the, yes we need that in a certain extent eh, but you know we have to build on our own laws as well because you no know, they uh they'll they're going to you know them out argue us every time we go to court because you know, it's there's in their favor so i think you know then the, the treaty itself is a process but I think you understand what the intent was the spirit of the treaty was all about. So I think if we can go backwards, you know, I think you'll understand what Northern we were talking about. So, Jimmy Gretchen, I thank you very much you know, for giving us a chance to speak, you know, the Northern uh, uh, this evening. Jimmy Gretchen. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you both for uh, coming and agreeing to sit with the, co the commission, sitting with myself and sharing um, honestly and openly your thoughts and uh, your messages with, with all of us. And I know I sit with you often, but I learn something each and every time that I sit with you. And so I want to thank you so much um, for agreeing and sharing um, your thoughts with us tonight. And and for our um, audience, thank you very much for, for your questions. And Elder Bone gave us a great segue into uh, our next topic in terms of understanding Indigenous law, that it is not a version of Canadian law. And so that will bring us to um, our next series, where, which will be next week in our second session, which is entitled, and I have to read it, Kinship Across Worlds, Unpacking the Political Power of Family. And that's with Professor Aaron Mills from McGill University. And we look forward to having Aaron with us here to share some of his thoughts. So again, thank you very much, miigwech, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>